Welcome everybody. Let's go and buy an extruder. Here from the uh, Perividex website, we can buy a nice four and a half inch used Brampton Engineering extruder, 31 L over D, gives us the horsepower. We even have a screen changer attached. And um, they give us all the information about the extruder, but what's in the barrel? If we move on to a four and a half inch Davis standard extruder, once again, we have a lot of information about the power of the extruder, the size, the center line height, whether they're including heat sh screen changers and even a gear pump in this one. But once again, what's in the barrel? Here we have a four and a half inch macro extruder, 26 to one air cooled. Again, they give us the motor power, the RPM, all the con whatever control systems it has. But once again, no information about what's in the barrel. Often they'll say that we have a general purpose three to one compression screw. But does this mean that we have a 300 thou deep feed section and a 100 thou deep metering section? Or do we have a 450 thou deep feed section and a 150 thou deep metering section? Or is it a 600 thou deep metering section, feed section and a 200 thou deep metering section? All of these have a three to one compression ratio. And we consider all of these to be GP or generally poor. Welcome. My name is Dr. John Perticulius and I'm with Compuplast. And as you may have guessed, today's webinar is on what's in your barrel. And while most of our presentation here will deal with extrusion, the information provided and the comments about knowing what's in your barrel are equally true for injection molding. So firstly, I'd like to say that there's some confidential information here that, um, because the case studies that you're gonna see are real problems and, and we've, we've done from consulting projects, in order to maintain confidentiality, we have removed the names of the customers and the actual geometry has also been changed, but the problems remain the same. Once you understand what's causing the problem, it's it's not too difficult to reproduce it on a different size extruder or a slightly different uh, geometry. So let's begin by trying to understand what some of the consequences are of not knowing what's in your barrel and how that screw affects the material that you are processing. Very common problem we find are gels or unmelts. Now those are two different things. Gels are cross-linked materials due to overheating. Unmelts are particles that haven't had enough energy, haven't completely melted. But in any case, these can appear in your product and they can occur in sheet, pipe, blow molding, injection molding parts, but they're generally more um, easily visible in film or clear parts where you have these little particles in the system. And this is a result of not having the correct screw design for the material that you're processing. Here we see overheated material making it difficult to produce this sheet as the gassing uh, causes the um, <clears throat> sheet to, uh, to tear and be discontinuous. And here we have some very overheated material which is causing a lot of gassing and rippling of the sheet to the point where you cannot make an acceptable product in this case. And when you buy an extruder or you have an extruder operating for a long time, there's also the issue of wear. Here we show a measurement made by our, our good friend and associate Tim Wilmer on a four and a half inch extruder where the upper section here shows the barrel wear and the bottom section of the L line shows the screw wear. And you can see here from the nominal position and the nominal clearance, we have at the end of the barrier section over 60 thousandths wear on the barrel, 
and 60 thousandths wear on the screw. And this changes significantly the performance of the, uh, of the screw. Uh, mainly, the larger gaps result in increased shear heating and higher melt temperature. So it's important to also monitor the wear of your, of your screw and understanding what the condition is of the, the screw that's in your barrel. We can also lead to, this can also lead to catastrophic screw failure if we don't have the right material processing for the right screw design. And we'll talk a little bit more about this. In fact, there are many problems that can be related directly to having the wrong screw for the material that you're processing. And here's a, a list of them here that we've addressed one way or another. The first example I want to go through in more detail here is this one. This example of a deformed pipe. Um, <clears throat> the client contacted us telling us that he couldn't make round pipe. He was having this flat spot on his pipe. And the client believed this to be caused by poor die design. So we visit the facilities, and they have essentially a setup like this, a typical setup, a die, the polymer coming out into a calibrator section first, and then going into a water tank for to complete the cooling. And sure enough, the material coming out of the die looked to be quite round. You know, you can see the material coming all the way out, uh, all the way around the die with no distortion. At the end of the calibrator, the material also seemed to be quite round. But at the end of the water tank, when you checked, put your hand around the pipe and it cooled down, the pipe had deformed and produced a, a flat side. This typically indicates a thermal problem. And you could easily verify it by simply slowing down the extruder and reducing the amount of shear heat that the screw generates. When you slow down your extruder, you reduce the temperature almost immediately of your polymer. And from there, if the problem gets reduced, then you know it's attributed to the screw design and the shear heat that's being generated. This client happened to have an IR thermal thermometer, a little IR gun. And we used it to investigate the temperature of the material coming out of the die. And when we checked the, the pipe, from one side, the IR gun read 200 degrees C. And the other side, the IR gun read 225 degrees C, which is a very significant difference in temperature. And even if the, uh, the customer that believed the IR gun was inaccurate, even if it's not exactly 225, maybe it was 230, the difference of 25 degrees C is probably quite true. And what happens when you have such a large temperature variation in the material and non-symmetric temperature variation, you have the one side of the pipe cooling first, and then, and when it cools, it shrinks, and then the other side cools and shrinks, because this side is already shrunk and frozen, this side creates additional stress from the shrinkage, and this results in a distortion of the product. So the problem is due to poor screw design. Or you're operating the screw at a condition that it wasn't designed for, which is essentially the same thing. Here is a <clears throat> screenshot from our simulation of the original conventional screw design, 17.8 millimeter deep feed section and um, 6.35 millimeter deep metering section with a mixer. And here we can see the barrel temperature profile that they had used. And their comment was that the barrel temperature profile maximum value was 210 degrees C. How could the IR gun indicate 225? And that's why they didn't believe that the gun, the uh, IR thermometer worked, worked well but they didn't realize the amount of viscous heating that can be generated inside the screw. Now, when we run a simulation of this screw design, we show here the solid bed ratio. This is the yellow material here, and it's, it's essentially the width of this yellow area versus the width of the channel. 
And as the material melts, this width gets narrower and narrower. And you can see here that it finishes well before the end of the screw, indicating that all the material has melted by this point. The blue line corresponding to the axis on the right is giving you the bulk average melt temperature. And here we can see that at the end of the screw, the bulk average temperature is 235 degrees C, even higher than what the IR thermometer indicated. In fact, if we look at the temperature across the depth of the channel, so here, this represents the depth of the channel here. So this is the screw surface on this side. This is the barrel surface on this side. And we're looking at the temperature variation through this channel. And this point here represents the peak temperature of 246 degrees Celsius within the melt stream. So coming off of this extruder, if we're holding our adapter at 190 degrees Celsius, we won't notice that the center has 246 degrees Celsius, even if we have a immersion melt thermocouple, because this thermocouple is highly affected, highly, um, the, 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 the temperature is, is um, influenced by the adapter that it's sitting in, the 190 degrees that it's sitting in, and that it's not deep enough to capture the peak temperature it may be reading 210 degrees Celsius, and you might very well believe that this is your true melt temperature. Now, in fact, um, the um, you can see here by the temperature profile, it's not exactly uh, very very uh, symmetric, and it's often the temperature profile is often skewed, so looking more like this, which explains why perhaps one side of the pipe is hotter than the other resulting in a non-symmetrical problem and ending up with a deformed pipe. All this is related to the screw design, the material properties that's being processed, and the process conditions. And ex since extruders often outlive their initial purpose, they're, they're often reused in applications with materials that the screws weren't intended to process and running under conditions, RPMs, that weren't part of the original design of the screw. So once we understand this, now we can go and engineer a new screw for the customer's material and designed at the required output rate that the customer can, can produce. And this is determined by his cooling system. So you do a cooling analysis to see what the maximum production rate or available cooling allows for line speed. And then based on knowing this output rate, you, and, and also the material, you take the, the uh, rheology of the material, here we show the shear viscosity, viscosity versus shear rate for this high density polyethylene that they were using. And we design a new screw. And in this case, we decided to go with a barrier type screw where we have a solids channel and a melt channel. The solids channel gets shallower as we move along and the melt channel gets deeper as we move along. That's represented by these uh, lines on this picture in here. And when we look at the simulation of the barrier screw, we see the solid bed ratio constantly reducing and slightly increasing just near the end where the barrier section closes off. But it doesn't go all the way up to one, meaning that the that the section is full of solid material. It never gets, <clears throat> not even above, uh, let's say 0.7. So 70% of this area has solid material and then it all melts because you can see here the melting, relative unmelted amount is reducing. This is essentially in indicating the melting rate, which is fairly constant, going to zero at the end of the barrier section. So this screw has been optimized to provide a uh, uh, good melting of the material. And also, if we look at the pressure generation, this is the block line corresponding to the axis on the left, we see a relatively gradual pressure increase without any sharp or any large changes, abrupt changes to deflect the screw. And if we look at the bulk average melt temperature, we see that the temperature increases gradually, but to a maximum of 224 degrees C. 
And if we look then at the temperature across the depth of the channel, again, this is representing the, the uh, depth of the channel at the end of the screw, we find that our peak temperature now is 230 degrees Celsius. And if we compare the two, we see the significant reduction in temperature from the original to the new design. And we make one other change. We, because the customer was holding their um, adapters at uh, around 200, 205 degrees, they were artificially creating a large temperature gradient. So we asked them to adjust their adapters and die set points to 220 degrees, which would result in a much lower variation in temperature across the melt stream. So the optimized screw design reduced the melt temperature variation, the pipe cooled more evenly, and the distortion was eliminated. So how do you determine what's in your barrel? Well, first of all, it needs to be measured. And this is often a good idea to periodically measure the screw and barrel to, to check for wear. And you can do this yourself, but often it's better to hire a professional to come in and they can check it in place, or you can send your screw out uh, to a screw shop to be more precisely measured. Then we need to determine if the screw is adequate for your materials. Uh, quite often, products change, resins change, but the extruder remains the same. And with the aid of simulation, we can determine how well a job the screw is doing in terms of melting your material and providing a good quality melt out of the end of the extruder. If it's not, then we can investigate rebuilding or modifying the screw, um, especially if the screw is sufficiently worn, we need to rebuild it to avoid the excess heat generation that's created by worn screws. And in, in many cases, it's possible to modify the screw to better suit the particular material and conditions you're running at that time. And I want to give an example of this. We showed earlier this uh, overheated sheet example. And here I have a um, sketch of the screw design that was used. It was basically a conventional screw with a mixer uh, on the tip. And we, uh, the, the customer told us that they had essentially two materials that were processing on this extruder, material A and material B. A was a problem, but B worked relatively well. And this is one of the other reasons we often recommend to people to get the shear viscosity curves as opposed to just using a melt index. A melt index is one point represented somewhere in the back here, the low shear rates. Um, by having the complete shear viscosity curve, you can compare materials more precisely and see that in the processing range, material A is about 40% more viscous than material B. So when you run them in the same screw design, the material that's more viscous is going to generate more shear heat. Consequently, on this extruder, which is an, an eight inch extruder, they're getting 8,700 pounds an hour with a peak temperature of 430 degrees Fahrenheit in the middle. And this happened to be too much for this particular material, causing the residual moisture in the material to gas off and, um, and, and giving them their problem. So we, we looked at the screw design and said, we could probably modify this screw by extending the compression section. So rather than compressing over um, when it was 65 inches, we move it to 106 inches. So we have a more gradual compression. We deepen the metering section from 554 to 580. And this is the advantage of a simulation is that you can, you can see how much of an effect this change has. On the outside, it may seem that, oh, 30,000 isn't very significant. But it does provide a significant amount of um, difference in shear and shear heat generation. And we also, um, uh, because we, lower, we, we increase the transition section, we lower the metering section, we reduce it 
to have less shear. And we modify the tip of the screw. We actually cut off about four diameters so that we can put a spiral fluted mixer, uh, two diameters of spiral fluted mixer, but not on the tip, moving it back into the last cooling zone of the extruder to provide us some ability to extract heat out of the material. So these were the modifications that were made to the screw. And consequently, um, when we look at the temperature across the channel, uh, and, and because we had a, an increase in output, by the way, because we did go deeper on the, on the metering depth. Uh, so at the same RPM, we're getting a peak temperature now of 384 degrees Fahrenheit. And if we compare these now in a, in a chart, we see the original design um, 8,700 pounds an hour at 430 degree peak temperature. The new design actually can get us up to 940 pounds an hour at 384 degrees Fahrenheit. So a 46 degree Fahrenheit drop. And in fact, if we ran the output back to 8,700 pounds an hour, that would mean slowing down the screw. There would be um, an even uh, greater change in temperature. But they found that they could operate at this condition and actually gain 700 pounds an hour in production without having the problems associated with the overheated, the screw that was causing the overheating. The next example I wanna measure is the, the example of catastrophic screw failure where we have a 150 millimeter screw that breaks. And you can see that the, that the break isn't happening in the feed section, it's actually in one of the thickest parts of the screw. I'm going to show you a, a, a drawing, a partial drawing of this screw, and we're going to focus on the compression section of the, the barrier section, the, the compression of the barrier section. And uh, here we have a solids channel, a melt channel. This is just showing us the solids channel. So the, the feed depth is 1.2 inches, and it compresses to 200 thou, and then it compresses to 100 thou. And the issue here is that we have a lead of 7.3 inches. So it's 7.3 inches for one rotation. And the compression here from 200 to 100 is happening in three inches. So less than half a turn, we're compressing this, uh, uh, this channel. We're closing it off very abruptly. Now, abrupt changes in depth is not a problem if all the material has melted. Right. So when we ran the simulation on this particular design, here's what we found. The um, black line represents the solid bed width ratio, which is corresponding to the axis on the left. And the blue line represents the relative unmelted amount. Now, these lines follow each other in the feed section because the channel is constant depth. And then at this point, we introduce the barrier section. And in the barrier section, we have the solids channel, which is compressing relatively fast, and the uh, melt channel, which is getting, getting deeper. But the rate of compression on the solids channel, if it's faster than the rate of melting, then you can see the solid bed width is actually going wider and wider and wider until it hits a value of one. That is, the, the, this uh, solids channel is completely full of solid material. And at this point, you're putting excess force on the screw. And you'll notice that near the end of the barrier section here, where it goes from 200 thou to 100 thou depth, you'll see at this point, we still have a significant amount of un unmelted material. So solids, uh, the solids channel depth reduces abruptly and a wedge force of the solid material causes the screw to deflect. Now, Typically, this results in a normal flight wear, but in this case, the channel depth reduction was too abrupt, let's say less than, less than, less than a half a, a rotation, and there was still about 30% unmelted material there, resulting in excessive unbalanced lateral force and excessive periodic screw deflection. This leads to what we call cyclic fatigue failure. And if we work out the cycles, over the course of a year, it was close to 40 million cycles per year. And just like you take a coat hanger and keep bending it, at some point it will fail. And this is what happened to this screw. Solution, very simply, 
optimize the barrier section, make less abrupt changes in the geometry. You should never have a change over less than one diameter so that the forces can be balanced around the circumference of the screw and make sure that the material and everything is uh, completely melted within the barrier section before you start closing the section off. Once we see this result in the simulation, we know that it's going to give us an acceptable performance and minimize the amount of wear that we might expect on the screw. So the conclusions and recommendations we have is know what's in your barrel. Find out what the screw was designed for or is capable of processing. Know your materials. Get rheology measurements periodically. And, and it may be worthwhile to find a lab and send materials out every four, six months, eight months, just to see if the material consistency is remaining the same. And know your process. Make sure you understand the optimum conditions for your material and your equipment. And, and understand that changing those conditions, changing the screw RPM, means that you're changing the temperature of the material, even though you haven't adjusted the barrel. Now, to help uh, people in this area, we've developed a um, new screw inspection and analysis service. This is a joint effort between uh, us, CompuPlast, Tim Wilmer Associates, and Performance Feed Screw, which manufactures screws where we can measure your uh, barrels. This can be done in your plant or at our facilities. You can ship the equipment out, the screw out, let's say, to measure it. We can have your resin characterized. We'll take the rheology measurements. And then we'll use our uh, virtual extrusion laboratory extruder module to simulate the performance of your screw under various process conditions. So you'll give us a range of what you plan to run or would like to run and a range of materials that you plan to run. And we will see how well that screw performs under those conditions, and then provide a report, which will be the inspection report of the screw for wear, indicating whether we recommend a rebuild. And uh, in addition to the geometry details, we will provide recommended process and material boundary conditions, let's say the operating window that is best suited to your particular screw design. And if it is totally unacceptable for what you would like to run, we can even propose perhaps some modifications to the screw. Some of you have heard the saying, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Or you can teach a man to fish and you either feed him for a lifetime or he spends his lifetime sitting in a boat and drinking beer. We hope that this isn't what's going to happen, uh, but in order to, to, to teach you how to do this yourself, uh, we've uh, developed a special uh, single screw maintenance and troubleshooting workshop, which is uh, actually being sponsored by the uh, Society of Plastics Engineers Ontario section and put on by, again, Performance Feed Screw, Tim Warmer and Associates, and CompuPlast. And this uh, is uh, going to be a full day event, which will discuss how you measure the, the screws, how you maintain the screws, when you need to go in for a, for a rebuild, how often you should, you should rebuild, and uh, how we go about analyzing and simulating the uh, performance of the screws. And this will be held at Performance Feed Screws um, in April of uh, 2019. So just visit speontario.ca for more details and to register for this event if you would like to participate. So finally, I would like to thank you for watching this video. And if you have any questions or would like to determine what's in your barrel, feel free to contact me at my email, jp at comedyplast.biz, or feel free to give me a call at this phone number. Thank you and have a good day.